Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on demystifying sustainable heating, hosted by Green Economy. My name is Talia Chalkowska. I'm a green tech consultant at Green Economy and your host for the next hour. This webinar form forms part of our demystifying series to help businesses better understand and build confidence in investing in these green technologies. So in the past, we've done webinars on demystifying solar, demystifying EV charge points, demystifying heat pumps, which is why, although heat pumps are a sustainable heating option, we're not going to be looking at them today because we've done a webinar just on heat pumps. Um, the format for today, so we're going to start with introductions very shortly, followed by a panel discussion, followed by a Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout, please add them in the Q&A section and we will address these at the end. So also we're recording, so if we want to make this publicly available afterwards on our YouTube channel, so just a FYI. So let's begin with introductions. So starting with you, Alistair, um, in these introductions, could we also include a bit of an overview on the technology that your business offers that we're going to explore today? Thanks very much, Talia. Yes, uh, my name is Alistair Deal job I'm the technical lead here at Green Economy. Uh, so a background, I'm a chartered waste manager, so I've some experience of that in the distant past. But my focus really in the last 15, 10, 15 years has been on uh, energy efficiency um, in industrial manufacturing processes. Thank you. Uh, Luke? Yes, hi, I'm Luke Cronshaw, the Commercial Director of Envirate HET Limited, uh, Stockport-based, Great Manchester-based uh, manufacturer of low-carbon electric radiators and low-carbon hot water cylinders. Um, primarily, a lot of the business was focused on the social housing sector for a number of years, but over the past sort of four years, I'd say, more commercial applications have become more viable as more um, commercial technologies are available and bundling systems together seems to work better. So, yes, a little bit about us. Thank you. And Mo, over to you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name's uh, Mohamed Hanslot, um, CEO of Bright Tech Technologies. Um, the company set up uh, 13 years ago, initially as a lighting company. Um, six years ago, one of the technologies that we introduced was um, uh, infrared heating, or far infrared heating, which is the correct terms. And um, yeah, it's been going from strength to strength. We're based in Bolton, which is the centre of Greater Manchester, as you all know. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mo. And finally, Simon. Oh, you're muted, I think. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm Simon Brown. I'm the uh, Partnerships Director here at EcoSync. I've got a background in property uh, and also in a sustainability background as well. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about EcoSync Smart TRV. So we're a prop tech business um, born out of Oxford University and we're delivering cost and carbon reductions of about 30 to 50 percent. Uh, and in some cases, actually even higher in non-domestic buildings around uh, around the country and we do this by installing our battery free and maintenance free smart trvs um essentially what you see on your on your radiator at home your one two three four five nozzle uh, we have a smart version for commercial buildings which is wireless and, uh, and battery free thank you so much for the intros everyone now let's start with some scene setting so looking at the why so, Alistair, over to you. Why do we need to decarbonize our heating systems? Yes, it's a good point. I think um, for, for various companies it's um, we, we speak to, certainly, there are really uh, varying reasons for doing this. Um, in terms of the wider business landscape, um, there's some serious acceleration in carbon reduction. Uh, interest and activity in businesses of all sizes but uh, traditionally we've seen that from large businesses so they have their own uh, goals and aims to reduce 
uh, impact on climate, uh, reduce the amount of waste they're producing and energy consumption. Um, but that's now pushing down to smaller companies or even medium sized and they themselves are pushing that onto smaller companies. So businesses we're seeing um, have really changed in the last, I suppose, seven, five, seven years. If, if people were to ask me at the time, it would have been um, for three reasons. So a, a company might want to look at decarbonizing uh, today, but back then it might have been looking at it from purely cost saving point of view. Um, because they wanted to keep a client happy um, or they wanted to do it to save the planet. And we're seeing those all those different reasons changing around now. So there's a real um, uh, push, but whilst there is a clear um, problem we have of, of lack of direction and leadership from government, it's the fact that we see a lot of businesses now are just going it on their own anyway, or, or in conjunction with their peers in, in industry groups, um, and in networks where they feel like there is a groundswell movement of companies who are wanting to reduce their own emissions and have started to look at plans to do so. Key issue, obviously, is uh, where is our carbon as, a, as it's a UK and also within those business sectors. So at the moment, heating, if you're including industrial processes, accounts for about 37% of UK carbon emissions. And therefore, if you break that down, heating in general, um, is around about 20% uh, of total UK carbon emissions come from the commercial and industrial sector. So it's a really big part of um, the problem and it's something we can do um, a lot about. So obviously that's why we're talking about it today is, is looking at some of the technologies and some of the um, solutions uh, for people to uh, reduce their impacts on their, uh, off their, of their heating systems. Thank you. So yeah, there's an obvious need to get sustainable heating in the business, but it's not always the easiest for a business to know whether it's the right technology for them. So again, for you, Alistair, um, what are the initial feasibility considerations a business should take into account? Yeah, I mean, I suppose that the, the first ones, um, the, the main thing I usually talk about is the cheapest energy um, that you pay for. Uh, from a business is that which you don't use. If, you, if you're trying to reduce the amount of energy you consume, that might be looking at <clears throat> how you um, insulate the building. So building fabric is something we, we look at um, a lot in, in the work that we do. The advice we give when we go to see businesses, I tend to focus on the lower cost, the quick wins that you can do tomorrow um, around draft proofing, seals around those doorways, roller shutter doors in, in a manufacturing or a warehouse setting. Uh, very often we see those have uh, left open a lot and it's just about simple changes they can do to um, remedy those situations. So it may not even need any expenditure, any capital expenditure or any um, significant changes in what they're doing, just a change in procedure. Um, things like even a pipe work insulation, it's so cheap. The returns are so quick, uh, it makes a lot of sense to tackle those problems first. But it's also about understanding where and when you're using your energy as well. So those um, sort of the data comes into it a lot as well. Um, and Luke, this one's for you. Uh, which technologies partner well with your radiators or whatever technology you're offering? Yeah, thanks, Elliot. And uh, yeah, I, I think um, with with anything these days, there's a lot of um, consideration that's given to how multiple systems can come together for the benefit of you know what we're trying to achieve. So, in terms of our systems, ours are the perfect partner for PV. Right? So, with with commercial premises, um, if we take sort of small to medium sized enterprises, uh, maybe you've got a manufacturer that. Um, if they either own the building or they're, they're renting or leasing, um, there's usually a lot of um, flexibility in what you want to do with the roof. So the perfect thing to do is if you've got a large roof, um, then if you flood the roof full of solar, you've got a lot of generation. Now, in most cases, if you do the entire roof, there's always a little bit of surplus there. And most traditional businesses would think, well, that's fine for export. But as if you if you really dial into the market at the moment, export really isn't. Um, as lucrative as it once was. So then you have to consider, well, what else could I do with that surplus? And the idea that if you 
tie in the surplus with either battery storage technology, which is again storing that that can be used for later. And then you can use that in those heating periods for electric heating, like the one behind me. Then you can suddenly store the excess that maybe would have been exported and take off your heating demand, which would then have more of a financial significant benefit than exporting at a, a low rate. So th there's there's lots of different things that can be bundled together for um, for making as much of the efficiencies that you've installed in the building um, stretch as long as possible. And the same can be said for the hot water cylinder side of the business as well. So where you have PV, you can instantly divert energy, free energy straight into the hot water cylinder. And although domestically we would say 60% of energy consumption goes to heating and 20% goes to hot water, commercially speaking, it's obviously a little bit less, so the less on the hot water side of things. But if we look at how to store energy properly, then there's even, you know, there's more assets that you can add into the building that can help decrease your sort of liabilities um, in terms of, you know, financial expenditure. So, yes, perfect partner for PV, uh, battery storage alongside electric heating and low carbon hot water. Thank you. Um, and we all obviously work in different types of offices, warehouses. Um, so, Mo, this is for you. Does the building type or business activity have an impact? On the type of heating we should use okay that's a, that's a good question okay so uh, i guess you can break it down buildings into two types you've got retrofit and you've got new builds um most of the heating technology out there um it's um it's great to put into new builds because you can specify the building you need to dig down so much insulation insulate it to a certain level um a lot of the uh, technologies out there it's about maintaining heat so keeping inside the building but a lot of the buildings what if it's a retrofit building what if it's an existing building what if um it's not well insulated um what happens then um and this is where fine thread comes into its own um it's uh, what if you haven't got a lot of space either that's another thing i need to uh, point out as well so this is where fine infrared is absolutely brilliant it's um super efficient it's easy install it's zero maintenance but more importantly um it's understanding how the technology works so traditional heating what it tends to do it warms the air and the air then circulates around the space um which in a way if you really think about it it's a bit inefficient whereas fine infrared it warms you it warms the uh, fabric of the building. It's fast, instant heat. So imagine, you know, when, when you're standing outside, the sun comes out, you feel the heat on you. And then it warms the surrounding areas and then it actually starts convecting. In the same way, when it works inside, you feel the heat straight away. So why it's good is because it doesn't matter whether it's retrofit or whether it's new build, it's gonna warm you first then it's gonna warm the fabric of the building, naturally start uh, convecting. Um, and then if you have a huge space, like a warehouse, for example, you don't need to, what do you call, heat the whole space. You can just focus on where the action is taking place. So that's what makes um, fire infrared heating very, very efficient um, and very unique as well, because it's modular. You can spare, you can one space at a time. So I guess, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Mo. Um, and this is a bit of a scenario question for you, Simon. I can also just hear my coffee machine automatically in itself. I'm so sorry. Um, Simon, so a lot of businesses might have radiators already that have thermostatic valves on them. So why should a business invest in smart thermostatic valves, radiator valves, so TRVs as they're known? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I think you can break it down into several points actually it's about delivering cost and carbon reductions and i mentioned that we're doing that in the region 30 to 50 percent or, or even higher for some clients uh, it's about control um, it's about assisting towards your net zero goals um, and it's also about helping buildings that are suffering from overheating and open windows and making them more comfortable to work in um, so we're essentially heating rooms when they need to be heated so when you're installing EcoSync, we offer it at a granular level. 
<clears throat> excuse me, a granular level. So we're giving the in-room, room-by-room room control, but we're making each room almost its own zone. So we're optimizing energy savings by heating according to occupancy um, and also according to need as well. We're speaking to clients every day. Some will turn their boiler on in September and turn it off in June. Others are heating whole buildings that are occupied for only a few hours a day. And they're openly admitting that, frankly, they've got no control over what's being heated or when. Along with energy costs being quite volatile, hybrid working being a lot more common than it was, say, five years ago. We're giving that room by room control in order to be able to heat according to your occupancy and need. And we can give that in our dynamic control center. So we've got a number of, it was sort of what we've got three default temperatures which assist in the energy saving journey. First of all, minimum and maximum temperatures are set for rooms and therefore a comfort temperature is set within this. We've got away settings for when the room isn't occupied and freeze protection temperatures for when the room isn't occupied for a longer amount of time as well. And you can also have scheduling from where you want to split the time during the day when the heating's on, you can have multiple schedules. So we're really saying when to deliver heat to certain rooms and, and at certain times. And then you also offer further levels of control, like we can integrate with calendars, which override what the building manager says is the default, default position. We've got in-room QR codes, um, which give certain rooms and certain users control. The away setting is a huge saver because say, for example, a student accommodation, a building manager, would never know if someone's gone home for the weekend, if they've gone away, if they're in lectures, if they're in the library. And so they can see every room and manage that you know, from afar. And from a maintenance perspective too, if there's any issues raised, stuck pins, rooms not being heated as they should, open windows, external heaters in the rooms, anomalies raised. Um, it, it's a fantastic tool for building managers, maintenance managers and facilities managers too, for them to really investigate if, there's, if there is an issue and, and to deal with, the, deal with the matter quickly. Thank you. So hopefully you've seen yourself fit into one of the scenarios that our panellists have outlined, whether you already have solar and you could get one of Luke's radiators or perhaps you're in a warehouse, you want to be heating the person rather than the space. So Mo could help you out. Um, so you know what you want, but now you need to start building the business case. You need to present to that decision maker. So how does a company build the business case? So Alistair, how can sustainable heating benefit a business? So it's a really uh, good point because we can make all these recommendations and all these great technologies you've just heard about um, make a lot of sense, but convincing the decision maker, and that not may not be you, you may not be the person who ultimately signs on the dotted line, but somebody within your company, you're, you're talking to a, um, a finance manager, the managing director, or a co-director of your business just to confirm this is the right thing to do. Building that business case, it's about um, giving a, a, a positive, you know, giving a benefit, giving a cost, um, uh, making a recommendation. And it could just be as simple as a, a, a two second conversation, uh, a two minute conversation uh, with, with a colleague. Uh, it could be a massively long detailed appraisal or report. But really where we're seeing the benefits to business are, as we mentioned, in terms of the carbon savings, so many more people are interested. So many more um, businesses that clients, um, companies that, that are, you're supplying to are going to be asking these questions. So if you can demonstrate that you have maybe measured your carbon Im impacts, um, uh, understand where you are now, where heating sits in terms of those impacts and then show a demonstration of how you're reducing those impacts year on year. It might be one of these technologies starts you off on that direction and another one is something you do in a year or two's time. So you're reducing your carbon impacts or showing that uh, is, is a great thing to do. Um, obviously, everybody's interested, as I mentioned before, about costs. Um, costs of, of doing business in general have gone sky high in the last two or three years. There's no real sign that energy prices are dropping um, down to anywhere near um, the levels they were two or three years ago. So gas, if that's the main primary use of, of uh, for heat in your business, gas costs are still going to be high. And unusual cases, they're three to four times higher than they were two or three years ago. So if you can find any way of reducing those costs, um, Building that business case in it, it gives it a really good, clear signal about the business benefits. You've then all, all got other things around um, 
the well-being of people that work in your business <clears throat> so if mo's example of the, the the warehouse you've got people picking and packing maybe you've just got a single work uh, work packing station um people are mobile around the warehouse but they're, they're stationary in one area you just want to heat those areas but maintain a comfortable level so that people are um, happy in their, their work happy people more productive people um you may be that you've got your products that you actually store or that you work with have to maintain maintained at a certain temperature or moisture is a real issue and until this point you maybe thought we can't afford to heat that whole area by traditional maybe a gas fire blower heater system or in a storage area you've just not got the amount of uh, money to spend to keep those products um, at temperature and, and these technologies can enable you to do that in a much more efficient cost-effective way and even in the actual work that you're doing if you're in a certain site um, tolerances is really key we found aerospace companies that were having parts rejected from a client because when they got to their site they were warm by five or seven degrees and they were out tolerance so even just the actual product you might be dealing with can make a, a, a temperature can be a really big factor in certain circumstances so you add all those things together things like occupational um, health and safety as well might be part of that um, you add all those things together and you start to build yourself a very compelling case to the, the, the person that might be paying the, the bills at the end of the day um, and, and directing them in the right uh, way to make a good uh, business case. It might not be one technology on its own. Uh, it might be wrapping several together to make a, a bigger project with a, a more comprehensive view. So you're not just taking things, looking at one project and seeing that in isolation. Yeah, cost savings are a big one. And I imagine that finance director is going to have a fair few questions. So one for you, Mo, how much do these technologies tend to cost? This is this is gonna make you fall off your chair. Um, as I said, you can you can start off with one little space, one room at a time. So you can you can stick a panel under your desk, and that's going to cost you less than a hundred pounds. But wattage wise, it's it's going to be anything from two seventy to three hundred and fifty watts. Right. So it's 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 unbelievable. Um, in terms of, there's one thing, by the way, that's uh, that I do like to pick up on. One of the things that um, people talk about is I feel cold all the time, you know, um, even though the heating's on, um, and that's interesting. And the reason why is because it's most heating technologies. What they do is they 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 warm the air, and then eventually the air gets to you. Um, once again, fire infrared is the only heating technology out there that warms you and warms you directly. Um, the other thing is, is that um, I, I give you a, a scenario as well in terms of cost, because we are talking about costs. Um, for example, you can have an office. Now, the challenge you've got in an office is that if you're heating the whole office, what you're going to have is you're going to have people who like different types of heat. So you're going to have Eskimos and you're going to have people who are you know, going to be freezing cold all the time. So how do you tackle that? How do you, how do you manage that? Um, and fine thread, believe it or not, is the one technology that can actually do that. You can actually have panels, individual panels on, uh, over each desk. So you can literally control who has the heat and who doesn't want the heat. You know? and, 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 that, and that's what makes the technology so unique. So yes, it is about efficiency yes it is it is about cost it is about uh heating a space in a very very efficient way but it's also about um heating the people who want it you know that's the way i'd look at it you know it's it not everybody likes a nice warm room you know so i i, I hope that answers your question welcome with a lot of different personalities aren't you um Okay, so this one's for you, Simon. Sometimes people are more attracted to a leasing type business model. So are there different business models available? So full purchase or leasing? There are, um, depending on model, sector, product type, et cetera. Um, for us at the moment, there are two costs. Um, there's an upfront cost for the hardware and we've got a sliding scale based on volume, et cetera. 
And then there's a yearly license fee for what is our control center, which is really where the data is because we're essentially a software company, we're a data company. Because not only does the software contain all the controls, but we've also got a carbon meter, which is an incredibly powerful tool, particularly in this day and age now, because we're not just measuring the temperature in the rooms, we're measuring the energy consumed or emitted by the radiators. So you can see the percentage of energy savings, you can see the highest and lowest consumer um, on a room by room basis. And this information can then be analyzed um, and you can start to identify issues, you can start to identify opportunities. Is it due to frequent use? Is a room always booked? Is the heating schedule on as long as it needs to be available for um, you know, relevant to, to the hours in the day? Or is it poor user behavior? Has the QR codes been used to push the temperature to the maximum frequent um, frequency? or a windows open a lot so it's very very strong but but not only from an ana analytics perspective but also from a reporting perspective to board members investors uh, investors um because rtrvs are sending data every five minutes so you can really get a strong overview of the performance of the building of the rooms of the floors and you can go back in time to show what was saved and when so as things stand at the moment for us we will provide clients with a calculation of costs based on a number of factors, current energy prices, any future hedge prices, so that we can give an ROI, which is typically between about two to three years. Um, but to go back to what you were saying or, or how we started, we are actually hoping to launch a leasing model imminently, which will make it even more affordable and more attractive. So we're still finalizing the details, but we've got in place agreed, what I feel is very attractive rates. Um, with an established leasing finance company that specialise in sustainability tech, such as LEDs and solar, et cetera. So it's certainly out there, something that we're hoping to roll out very, very quickly, um, which is really exciting for us and, and hopefully for our future clients as well. Amazing. Thank you, Simon. Um, and back to the questions that that finance director will inevitably have. Luke, what sort of payback should a business expect if they're investing in your technology? Yeah, so obviously the, the correct answer is always immediately. Yeah, but it's, that's never what happens. Um, I wanted to pick up on a couple of things in this subject that have been rolled through um, before getting to that one. So Alistair makes a, an excellent point for businesses in terms of how do we create this case study for what we're trying to implement. One of the things that, uh, and there's plenty of case studies about this, but one of the things that's becoming more and more prevalent, um, it, it's certainly business to business, um, and if we're dealing with public sector specifically, um, then supply chain decarbonisation is becoming more and more prevalent. The idea that you as a business that are providing a service are looking at your carbon emissions and your contribution to carbon in the economy um, is something that's, that's becoming increasingly more um, desirable for you to show that you're able to you know you've you've looked at you've done an audit and you're working on a plan it doesn't have to be immediate these are long-term plans that can be done and you can show that you're making significant investments in the business to decarbonize and that although it looks good that does turn into you know increased winning tenders there are certain points that are being allocated to these things now where you're demonstrating yes we're committed to this we we align with what you're doing and then you get more work. So some fantastic case studies. Um, I think Green Economy have done one, if not it would be under the wider sort of growth company, which is Thomas Neal. Um, that company supplies bedding and things like that into all sorts of sectors, but they've done a proper journey of decarbonisation, looking all the way through to the supply chain, through to how their processes are in place, EVs and all the rest of it. And there's a fantastic bit of um, uh, work that's been put into that to demonstrate how decarbonizing can also increase profits and things like that. So that kind of has a knock on effect in terms of, you know, how much does the technologies cost, you know, running costs and all the rest of it. So obviously, as the other guys have said with their respective technologies, a lot of this comes down to controllability as well, where the incumbent systems aren't very well controlled and monitored. Now we're starting to move into a place of being really precise about what we want to achieve and how we get there. So increased control, increased um, control of the environment as well, building insulation, things like that. All of this stuff comes together to really um, make sure that what we're trying to do now is not fit and forget. You know, it's to be able to put something in that's precise, change some behaviours and then see the results after that. And the beauty of all the technologies that are being discussed today is Everything is tracked and monitored, so you can see the impact of what you're doing. So typically, in terms of 
payback periods, again, there's always the, the adage, it depends. Now, we've done different sectors. So, for instance, we've had a care home that's had about 150 kilowatts of PV, um, 150 of our heaters, and we've had a payback period of four years, two months, because of the amount of generation that's being able to be generated from the solar, invested in the heating system, which means that they've ripped out an entire gas heating system, saving 30, 40 tonnes a year in terms of carbon and CO2, which is helping their green credentials, credentials but it's also helping to um, reduce running costs up annual savings of 40, 50, 60,000 pounds a year, given that four year payback period. So there's scenarios there that are like that. Then there are other scenarios where you could have something as little as two year payback periods, maybe inside of 18 months. Um, it really does depend on the application. But as a rule of thumb, we would say for our technologies, then it's about a five year payback period. And that ties in with any of the different finance models that you can get. So. There are now, certainly with our technologies, there are asset finance uh, options available, which, you know, looking at the, the value of the products we put putting into the property, the case study of saying, well, we're doing X, Y, and Z. We anticipate savings of 1,500 quid a month, therefore, uh, over a 10-year period, we'll have recouped our money inside of, like I say, four or five years. But then you might only be charged 850 quid a month um, in terms of your asset finance. So therefore, you go a couple of hundred quid ahead every month. So that's nice and easy for the cash flow, nice and easy for the FD to go, oh, well, yeah, it kind of makes sense. We're going to be here for the foreseeable. We anticipate X, Y, and Z. So there's lots of uh, factors that come in place. But again, this all, all boils down to a proper assessment of the building that we're entering into. It's a proper assessment of how the building is used what other technologies complementary could be used to make this more effective because you might just go with one technology and have a really long payback period but if you manage to stump up a little bit more cash you're able to do multiple technologies the payback period comes much quicker because there's more flexibility in the system so all of this comes down to data understanding how the building is used understanding the applications and the limitations of the technology understanding workflows and all of that and then putting together a succinct uh, proposal there to be discussed so that you're not just going to the FD or to whoever the you know the boss and say, I've seen this really great bit of gear. Uh, should we have a look at this? It's a proper thought out proposal. This is a business at the end of the day, and we have to make sure we're effective. And again, if we can demonstrate decarbonisation, reduction in energy, and all the rest of it, then that has a bigger selling point for that business itself as we look down the supply chain and potentially we need more tenders and contracts. So a lot to consider here. Thank you, Luke. So. As Luke said, you've submitted your very detailed proposal to that decision maker. They've agreed. You're now at installation stage. So let's delve into that in a bit more detail. So for you, Simon, how long does a typical install take? Like was just touched upon, I think it, it of course, depends on the product. I can only tell you about EcoSync. Um, and our whole process is, is very, very simple and easy. Each TRV. I mean, an install can be anything from 30 to 50 TRVs up to 500 to 1,000 TRVs, even 2,000 TRVs, depending on, on the site. But each of our TRVs take about a minute to install. Um, but there's a whole process sort of prior to that. Um, so prior to any install, there is a an on-site fact-finding process just to check current TRVs that are installed on the RADs, the boiler system that's in place, adapters that are in place currently to review floor, uh, floor plans, confirm radiator count, et cetera. And for us, once that full survey is completed um, by our customer success team, then once the client confirms that they want to go ahead with an install, we've got qualified heating engineers who will be on site for a whole day. So the actual dashboard itself takes about an hour to train. Um, no more, it's, it's very, very simple to use. And we always emphasize the importance of a uh, sort of an eco-sync champion, so somebody that is the main point of contact. Um, but we'll often find that three, four, five, six maintenance people will will be there on the day to learn more about what we're doing. We will train that team on how to install each TRV. Like I said, it takes about a minute per rad. Um, so there's no disruption on any type of building. We're installed in um, uh, higher education, a lot of universities. Um, we're growing very, very quickly in the PBSA, the purpose-built student accommodation sector, schools, um, offices, uh, even in hotels. So we're very, very disruption-free. So you can comfortably get about 100 or, or 200 day uh, uh, TRVs installed 
uh, in the day, depending on the team as well. So that's, in, uh, that's assisting. So how we tend to see it is that clients will then roll out if it's going to take more than one day, if it's more than about 200 TRVs, clients will just roll out with their own pleasure over the following few days once we're off site. Um, but we leave it all set up for them on the day. Support's always available through our customer success team whenever it's needed. Um, I've assisted in stalls. I'm, I'm the least techie person in the world. Um, it's not a permanent change to the building either. You don't need any building regs, um, you don't need any planning permissions. You're just simply replacing current valves. So even if you're just a tenant, um, you can you can install it and then just take them with you to another building once your lease is up if you are growing and and you just move you just simply create a new floor plan um but then post installation i think that is also something that, that is very important to touch upon in our sector so we after a month will provide a detailed health check report so we'll be looking at what savings have been generated how the technology is being used what anomalies have been raised any open windows that are detected how many interactions have happened with the in-room QR codes, if any stuck pins were detected, if there's been any detection because the boiler's not doing what it should be doing. We've actually called clients directly at, at seven, eight in the morning and said, we've noticed your boiler's off and it should be on. And and they've very quickly been able to, to rectify. So we, we can see problems before the clients can. Um, and then mid-season, we'll also provide another health check report as well. And, and then at the end of the season, we'll provide a complete report so that we can demonstrate what's been saved. So I think when you're doing things around heating seasons and organizations have targets, yearly type 2037, 2030, internal targets, financial targets that have been touched upon as well, we can not only show you what's been saved, but also look at the further areas of improvement and we can do benchmarking in comparisons to other, set, uh, other sites where things can be achieved. So although the install for any technology may be fairly simple or standard. I think that aftercare part is incredibly important now because we're all trying to achieve the same goal. Thank you. Yeah, we'll touch more on the aftercare part in, at the end of the webinar, but thank you so much for that. Um, and Luke, I wonder with your technology, because it's a bit larger than a valve, um, what, what does the disruption look like in your, your world? Yeah, so again, um... You know, a lot's been mentioned there from Simon um, that kind of follows across is with with any proper plan is like you can mitigate a lot of um, sort of problems, really. But in terms of the level of disruption a business um, should expect, um, the, the task is always minimal, um, which is to say, look, if you're if you've got existing infrastructure in there, um, electrical infrastructure is already plug and play ready to use so existing circuitry because of the low consumption of each of the heaters um the existing infrastructure can be used anyway so 600 watts for a panel this size behind me one and a half meters applies to thermal output but only 0.6 kilowatts that's more than enough just to spur off an existing socket so you don't need to put extra radials and all the rest of it so the disruption is very minimal um in terms of installation it's two rad brackets and it's hang into a few spur and you sort it um thermostats again power supply to them so the disruption should be minimal we've done um uh projects whereby you've got a an existing gas infrastructure that's um that's in a, a listed building that's been used for commercial premises uh, commercial purposes and the existing gas infrastructure has just been capped off installed installed done within a day um, and then everything's up and running so the disruption is always down to a minimum. We've got four holes to drill, fix, and then uh, into a spur. Um, like I said, the aftercare and all the rest of it, that comes down to being very responsive in terms of the problems with the product. The good thing about these systems are it's not wet. So if there's a problem with one central, we use heat pump, for an example, you put a new heat pump into the premises, you've got radiators all over the place. If there's a problem with the heat pump, there's a problem with the whole site. Whereas this, if there's a problem with one heater, it's a problem for one room or one zone, and therefore it doesn't disrupt the business. We we know from doing, like say, in the education sector, like Simon, colleges, schools, etc. If the boiler goes down, all the kids have got to go back home, and that's not really um, good. So having a system that is modular, that is able to be controlled and managed um, individually uh, and isolated, is something that minimises disruption. Uh, massively so. So yeah, um, 
in terms of installations, they can be done inside of a day, inside of two days. It depends on the size of the project. If you've got 150 offices um, or the multiple floors of the building, then you work a phase plan for it and you work around the clock. You can go off site, out of hours, and all the rest of it. With these being electric heating and just hot water cylinders, there really is not a lot of uh, disruption there. If you put a whole new wet system in, that's when you're digging floors up, chasing through walls and all the rest of it. So there are many benefits to looking at these kind of uh, technologies. It sounds like there's very little disruption for both of your cases there. Um, and Mo, what about you when it comes to infrared heating and underfloor heating? Um, do you have to shut down power? Do you have to shut down operations to carry out the install? Okay. So, oh, hang on. Um, can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. All yeah. Good. Okay. Right. Okay. So um, the heating is electric. So the the beauty about our type of heating is um, depends how you want it installed. You can do DIY, which is basically four screws, put the panel on the wall, plug it in um, after you've bought a plug-in thermostat from Amazon.com. So you plug that in, you're good to go. Um, obviously, if you've got uh, a, a commercial building, um, you want it hardwired into a thermostat, or uh, you've got, for example, we did a job recently for um, Selfridges in um, Manchester City Centre. They had um, uh, in the delivery area, um, they had these enormous gas heaters. They wanted them replaced and they just wanted the heat localized. So we installed bar heaters where the action was taking place. Um, that, that install happened overnight, uh, over two days, because of the way they had to run the, uh, the, the wires back. But the, the disruption is minimal because it's electric. You know? So it can take anything from, you know, depending on who's doing it, from 10 minutes to you know uh an hour as long as you have a good electrician you know um and and it also depends as mentioned before how many um heaters are are being installed you know how many rooms are being installed you know um how far does the wiring have to go back to to the mains board you know um so yeah i mean in terms of install it's pretty fast yeah. I'll try to stick to the question this time thank you mo um okay so a business has got the tech installed now they're thinking about the aftercare what steps do they need to make sure the system's running efficiently so luke you actually mentioned this before the fit and forget is it a case of fitting and forgetting um, controversially i'm going to say no um we don't fit and forget things these days if a business is making a significant investment and having to track this we're not going to forget about it we're going to be on it um looking at how the building is used looking at how uh energy consumption is flowing and then continuing that case study because this is an investment not just for now for a quick fix this is going to be something that's going to be for the business for x amount of years if you've got a payback period in line and you know how to achieve that and you know how to model the building etc then you have to stay on task but in terms of people having um the so reluctance to constantly be looking at something and tweaking something all, all, all the time, that's not the case. It is a case of once it's installed and programmed and it's learning how the fabric is heating up and losing its heat and it's adapting to those things automatically with the smart thermostat system that's included, then it's a case of, yes, leave it, but monitor it. It's not a case of fit and forget in the traditional sense of, ah, oh, it's fixed now, off we crack. You know, it's, you have to be, it's an investment at the end of the day. So something like that in terms of a commercial organization, you know, you need to be sort of keeping an eye on it. But as with a lot of the things that are available now is the heater will heat a room and it will do its job automatically. So with that, um, we're able to sort of provide a service where it's okay. You can leave it running, it's fine. Thank you, Luke. Um, and how easy is it to operate the tech? So I think, Simon, you mentioned this previously about you carried out some training for the maintenance staff. Could you repeat that? 
Oh, I think you're muted again. I'm not sure. Don't know what happened. Can you hear me okay? Yep. I think some wonderful technical difficulties today. Um, yeah, so I think I mentioned the dashboard, um, our online platform takes no more than about an hour to train. Um, I mentioned about the EcoSync champion, that, or, or as I call it, the EcoSync champion, sort of the main points of contact. Um, and also we'll then train any on-site or, or even external maintenance teams about how to install um, the TRVs as well. And, th and then from there, it, it, it's really plug and play and, and it's down to the client, depending on how much they want to spend time doing it. If you don't touch the platform post installation, we're confident to achieve at least 20, 25% energy savings. But some clients will look at it once a week, um, bar when an, other than when an anomaly is raised. Um, others will check it every day, um, particularly as it really helps from a maintenance perspective. And they will often then tweak and sort of fine tune it um, as time goes on or post one of our reports and the data that we're providing. So if we spot anything, um, or any user behavior that can be changed or any of their scheduling that then needs to be changed as well. Um, but they will regularly use the carbon calculator as well because it helps at a number of different levels. It helps from the board member perspective, from investors now, James Langlois, Sally, having a huge emphasis on how the data that investors want to see prior to potentially purchasing buildings or investing in buildings. It's important for owners um, and it's also important for FM companies as well because the history that we can show them can be very, very useful for their companies because they've got contracts with targets in place. So they can improve temperatures, how quickly they responded to things when the heating was on, room temperatures, um, flow temperatures of radiator water anomalies where certain things happened as well. Um, and because we're battery free, because we're wireless, because we're maintenance free, with there being no installation costs, no disruption, you just do plug and play. Um, it is incredibly easy to operate and that really helps from an upsell perspective as well so what we will tend to see is obviously your heating season is, is x amount of months clients will install they will see the success they'll install say 50 100 150 trvs and then they will quickly want to leverage on that they want to install across more floors across other buildings um depending on the campus size etc um an example actually is recently a purpose-built student accommodation that we're working with they had about 78 TRVs installed, I think, in Bristol, and, and we're now just in the process of rolling out across their whole um, wet rad site, which is about 26 um, of their 80 building portfolio. It's about 2,800 rads, roughly. Um, they now know how to install the technology, um, and therefore this, the time can move on uh, a lot quicker as well. So that, that point is very, very important in terms of the operation element. and. And from an upsell perspective as well, because like I mentioned earlier, every, internal companies and externals have have targets that they need to hit on their on their journey to net zero. Definitely, thank you, Simon. And the final question to the panel today um, for you, Luke. I actually, I'll give this to you, Mo. <laughs> I feel like you've not asked a question in this round. Um, what type of warranties guarantees do you offer on your technology? Um. So we um, uh, we offer a five year warranty um, as there's no moving parts. You know, I mean, it doesn't need servicing. So you know, it, it's it's a five year warranty, uh, no quibble warranty. Um, the company itself, as I said, we we set up a separate company, um, uh, which was an e commerce operation to. Um, sell the infrared heating and that's been going now for almost seven years um uh, and um from the way it shows it it lasts a lot lot longer than that you know so i guess that's testimony to to the fact that you know we can offer a five-year no quibble warranty um and it and it more than lasts the course in fact it'll surpass most people's expectations thank you Mary. Um, that brings us to our Q&A section. So I think we've had, actually had a few drop in in this time. So I'm going to pass you over to my colleague, Tim, who will manage the questions. And please ask more if you have any Q&A section. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I think the breadth of conversation has been very good because we only have a couple of questions. But we'll start with this one from Rachel. 
Um, in particular, she wants to know, are the far infrared heaters easy to reinstall if relocating? And I suppose we could broaden this question to um, all of the technologies we discussed today. What, what are the uh, opportunities for relocating, reinstalling? Is that is that viable? Sorry, if anyone wants to jump in for that, I'm not going to aim this at anyone in particular. So um, feel free to just uh, unmute and jump in if you feel like taking this question. Okay. So uh, as it's mentioned, fine for red heaters. Um, the answer, short answer is yes. A lot of the heaters come with a plug. So it's just a, question, a case of unplugging them uh, and then just uh, lift them off, uh, lifting them off or unscrewing them from the walls. Um, if they've been hardwired in, come with a cable. So just a question of um, once again um, undoing it from the from the fuse spur. So yeah, very very easy to reinstall. I'd like to yeah. jump in as well. Brilliant. Thank so, you very much. Oh, um, sorry, go on, Luke. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, in terms of reinstallation, etc., it's easy enough. Like this lift off the bracket's exactly the same. One thing that I would uh, question is um, part of the proper heating design is heat loss calculations. So if we are removing heaters that are given X amount of thermal heat output, the capacity, the wattage that's given to the room, and we're relocating to another room, it's not correctly sized, then potentially you're doing more harm than good. So although, yes, lifting things off walls and moving to a different room, if that heater is oversized or undersized, it's not going to perform exactly as it should perform. So when we're looking at things like that, we have to be careful. Well, in principle, yes, it, it can be done. Um, just something to bear in mind on that one there. I think finally, just from myself as well, I, I mentioned it just to sort of echo it. We're not making any permanent changes at all to buildings. We're simply replacing the TRVs um, that are on the radiator. We're just replacing the current valves. So even if you're a tenant, you don't need to change anything. If you're also a short term or a long term lease in an office, for example, you can simply just take it with you to another building and just to upload your new floor plans um, to uh, to the platform. So from our perspective, there's no uh, there's no changes at all. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we have another question here, particularly regarding looking for a supplier when you want to implement these heating efficiency measures. So are there any particular standards or industry certifications um, people should be looking out for? when they're going through quotations and deciding which company to select as their supplier. Um, again, whoever would like to take this question. So, um, what can I say about fire red heating? I mean, it, it, it's so simple. Look, we've got a website. We set up an e-commerce website. And um, what you do is you go in there, um and you tap in the length width and the height of the space that you want to heat up and it'll tell you what wattage is required okay um all the products are are certified um and uh, certified to ce standard electrical safety standards um and they'll and they'll do the job i think if you if you you don't need an expert to tell you uh with fine for heating is it good or is it not good or how much wattage is needed to heat a space because we've got a calculator a very simple calculator that helps you do that um uh if you like to give me a uh, thought if you want me to give the website i'm more than happy to do that or it's it's up to you oh by the way guys i'll be sharing everyone's contact details if you have any yeah. more follow-up questions for the panel yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's the way um, technology should be. If it's uh, with heating technology, sometimes it can get too complicated. The way I see it, it should be simple. I want to heat a space. What do I need? Um, uh, and how much is it going to cost me? And that's how it should be. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mo. Um, we'll move on to the next question here. This one is about staff engagement so what is the best way to engage your staff to gather data and requirements to improve office and warehouse environments so how do you get your staff on board of this alistair perhaps this question is best suited for you 
Yeah, I think it's it's about understanding motivations. So what what people are um, particularly on any maybe on a particular day or week or month, what what those people um, uh, are motivated to do. Is it something where they can see there's direct um, uh, results and impacts? So it's about feedback. Um, you've got to be able to see the benefits of doing uh, some of these projects. Uh, see the results in real real time if you can with a lot of these these platforms and, and the software provider you can instantly see whether something has made a difference or not for some other <clears throat> technology types it may be that's something you, you need to monitor over a longer period of time to see the effectiveness of these measures you show that to staff employees it's going to be a really quick way of them seeing okay what i did a change i made even if it was a low cost didn't cost any money maybe something i did made a change it's reduced our energy our carbon impacts reduced the cost of the business um, it might be that they need some incentivizing so they just something in there to make them feel like there's possibly a financial reward in them in there if they uh, help implement some of these measures because some of this is is technology that you have to fit and get other people to use correctly some of it just needs somebody to monitor and control it uh, and, and obviously a lot of it is is working on systems which are self-learning and, and doing it themselves so understanding yeah how how they can see a benefit to them in their day job as well i, I agree if i can just jump and sort of echo that i absolutely agree and i think it's it's about educating on the change in user behavior um you know we see for example we offer differing levels of control and one of those is in-room qr codes now it's not suited for every type of client and actually some would like it more than others um but what we see that the ministry of defense are doing this very interestingly and also several um, student accommodation providers but they're actually gamifying the whole process so when i say qr code they simply just scan their phone to the qr code on the wall and it brings up temperature in their room but they can also then obviously adjust that at the higher or lower but they can also see the energy savings across their floor or in other buildings and it's making that we have what's called the leaderboard on there so it's almost making it a little bit of a competition there's a lot of people now that are a lot more uh people now that are sustainability focused than than has been over the last number of years because it's at the top of a lot of agendas um and so you will have people that want to be on board with that and once they can see that they are making a change that they are having a positive impact um and, and almost gamifying that situation it can a little bit of competition never never harmed anybody Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. Um, oh, sorry. Was that someone else? Sorry, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I was just gonna, I was just gonna second that for um for Sam as well. As, yeah, like I said, gamifying things like this is it, it's a good way to to engage. Um, but the thing is that has a ripple effect for people when they go home. Okay, so these ideas, these principles in work, where they're spending a lot of time, they're seeing management invest in X, Y, and Z. Suddenly, then they can start to say, well, that seems to be working. Uh, sorry, at work, and I can transfer that to home. So you're starting to see this ripple effect. You know, we, we all need um, certain early adopters and innovators and all the rest of it, and we're starting to see that now with general public discourse around energy efficiency. So to be able to do that is um, is really interesting. There's, as with any sophisticated set of controls, is you should be able in the business to see which zone is overheated, is costing more money, and understanding why. Okay, so you can look on, you know, on the online systems and detect where problems are or where certain areas are underheated and then there's other problems. Potentially, we've got an increase in condensation and mold and things like that. Well, that's because that room is underheated because it's just a stock room. But the problem is, is that the fabric isn't warm enough and therefore we're potentially going to get more issues. So being able to see that across the range of the site and help people see the impacts of decisions as well in, in real time certainly helps as well so yeah all of this consciously and subconsciously helps affect change brilliant thank you very much um i think that's all we have time for in terms of the questions today i've noticed in the chat there is a question about air source heat pumps and about solar um i just like to direct you to our online resources we have previously done webinars on demystifying solar and demystifying heat pumps where we had very similar questions asked which were addressed by the panel so um, if you visit our website, you should find plenty of resource on this and hopefully you'll find answers there. Otherwise, I'll pass it back to you, Talia. Thank you. 
So I've just got a few closing remarks. First of all, thank you so much to the panel, true experts, and thank you to the audience for coming along too. As I said, this is part of our demystifying series. So our next webinar is on demystifying sustainable lighting, which is on the 12th of March. Um, as I said, we will share all of the contact details of the panelists today so that you can ask any follow up questions. Um, and this is recorded and will be available on our YouTube page, Green Economy YouTube page. I also wanted to highlight our Journey to Net Zero workshop program. So this is a three day training course supporting businesses of any size, any sector to decarbonize. Mm -hmm. It's really a great workshop. You look at measuring your carbon footprint, steps to reduce it, how to motivate your workforce, get an environmental policy in place. You literally you learn so much and yeah, would thoroughly recommend it. Um, and every business in Greater Manchester is entitled to one fully funded spot on the cohort. So check it out. Also, everything I'm talking about, I'll send you a follow up email with links and more information. So don't worry about scrub, scribbling it all down now. Um, if you are a business that offers some sort of green technology or service like the businesses on our panel today, there's also fully funded support for you from Green Economy. I will send you a bit of an overview of what that looks like. And also LEAD, which is a government programme aimed at um, homeowners in Greater Manchester. It's a portal where you answer some questions and it outlines what grants and support advice is available to you to retrofit and make your home more energy efficient. So I will leave it there. We're one minute over. I just want to say thank you again, everyone, for coming. And till next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.